Welcome to my happy place, or as most people know it, Arctic Scandinavia. It's October 2020 and I found my way back up here for the sixth time in the last few years. I'm here to spend eight days trekking and wild camping by myself. I'm in one of Europe's most spectacular wilderness areas, Sweden's Kebnekaiser Mountains, 250 kilometres north of the Arctic Circle. I'd hoped this would be a straightforward trip, but I was shown once again the truth in the saying that it's not an adventure until something's gone wrong. Before I get stuck in, I should probably introduce myself. I'm Anna, adventurer, photographer, writer and Arctic Scandinavia enthusiast. I've been completely fascinated by this part of Sweden since I first came here in 2016 and I've been back at every opportunity. In 2019, I even spent a few months trekking over a thousand kilometres up here by myself. This time, I'm not here to go particularly far or fast. Instead, I want to immerse myself in this landscape and environment that I am truly in awe of, a place that has undeniably become a refuge to me. As I set off, it felt distinctly autumnal, though there was a definite chill to the air. I had everything I needed in my rucksack, tent, warm clothing, camera gear, and enough food and snacks for the duration of the trip, plus some emergency reserves. It weighed around 25 kilos. That evening, I huddled inside my tent to cook my dinner as rain drummed against the fabric. In the morning, I woke to discover that my tent had frozen. Seeing this and the fresh dusting of snow on the mountain tops brought me inexplicable excitement for what lay ahead. That day, the smallest of things brought me joy, like crunching along the frosty planks of wood that make up sections of the path or unexpected good weather. Oh my gosh, the sun has just come out and yes, it's still absolutely freezing, but I'll tell you what, the warmth of those rays is just divine. So quickly I started to remember exactly why I love being up here. The views, remoteness, those first glimpses of reindeer trotting past, how crisp bread with ham and cheese from a tube tastes extraordinarily delicious when you're hungry and a bit cold, but somewhere this spectacular. I couldn't have asked for a more beautiful end to that second day. The dwindling light was magical, and the air was so calm that the snowy mountains surrounding me were immaculately reflected in the still water below. Sitting outside my tent that afternoon, I felt a sense of peace and contentment that I only experience on adventures like these, where life is stripped back to the basics. After a freezing night, I woke to very different weather on day three. Gone were the stillness and those incredible reflections. In their place was strong wind and icy snow. Those bitter conditions didn't let up for most of the day, with intermittent flurries that stung my face as the strong wind whipped them at me viciously. Yet the novelty of this weather and the beauty of my surroundings despite it meant I didn't really mind. Besides, Today I was trekking through probably my favourite valley in the area, Vistastalen. I trekked through here the year before. It was the height of summer then, and very different weather, but I still felt as captivated now by this valley and the enormity of the mountains as I did that first time. Reaching the huts at the bottom of the valley that afternoon, the wind was so strong my feet were almost getting knocked out from under me. I was cold, exhausted and hungry, so decided to spend the night in the hut, rather than battling the wind to get my tent up. Oh man, I'm absolutely, I'm wiped and pooped. Um, normally the stugas are closed at this time of year, but they'll often leave one open um, in case of really bad weather. Um, so I'm absolutely making the most of that. I've got a fire going. Um, 
and we're gonna have some dinner, have a cup of tea, and I'm already feeling better uh, having having kind of just stopped and regrouped a little bit, put on some more layers. The following morning, I made the most of the cabin's warmth, taking a slow breakfast and studying the map to see what lay ahead. Eventually, I managed to drag myself away from the comfort and back out into the cold, biting wind. As I left the cabin, the first flakes of snow began to fall and they didn't stop all day. Making my way higher up the valley, I was awestruck by the beauty and how inhospitable the landscape was. The bracing wind and snow were relentless, making everything that bit harder. Somehow, these harsh conditions make me feel more alive, more in tune with myself and the world around me. By that afternoon, the snowfall felt different. It was no longer icy and hard. Now it was thick and fluffy, flurries of it tumbling down from the sky and settling in a determined carpet over the landscape. I was mesmerised and moved by how still and quiet the world around me became. By four o'clock the light was rapidly fading and I stopped to pitch my tent in one of the most desolate landscapes I've camped in. I find this starkness beautiful and being completely alone in this environment empowering. In the morning there was a layer of snow and ice clinging to the fabric of my tent. The day that followed was long and gruelling. After briefly descending into a reindeer-filled valley, I faced a long, steep climb up to Chechka Pass. At nearly 1,200 metres above sea level, it is often snow-covered in the height of summer, let alone this late in the autumn. Later that night, I was woken up by the silence. Usually, I can hear my tent fabric moving in the wind, but now there was nothing. I felt a flutter of nerves as I realised that a heavy snowfall must have covered my tent. Thankfully, I wasn't completely buried, but the world outside my tent was undoubtedly transformed into a winter wonderland. I revelled in this fresh, deeper snow and the picture-perfect reindeer that were all around, my sense of excitement heightened by the fact that I was entirely alone, still days away from the nearest signs of civilization. It is Saturday morning, day six for me out here, and I just realized that I haven't seen another person since Monday morning. Um, six days, that's quite a long time to be out, out here in these sorts of conditions without seeing another person. I haven't had any phone signal, haven't had messages on my Garmin or anything just been completely off grid by myself and it's been absolutely incredible. Unfortunately, within a few hours, that excitement at the amount of snow had worn off as the reality of the situation hit home. By early afternoon, there was so much snow that I was often up to my knees and waist or attempting to walk across the tops of the bushes and small trees that were now almost fully buried. As the wind picked up, the temperature dropped to around minus 15. I battled my way to a boat shelter that I knew was nearby and managed to get my tent pitched inside. There was no way it would have stood up to the conditions otherwise. I spent around 18 hours weighing up how to handle the situation, battling intense feelings of isolation and vulnerability. From last night through until now, it's um, about four o'clock, it has not stopped snowing, like blizzard snow. Um, and I'm now encountering like knee deep snow, um, which is just <laughs> exhausting and pretty impossible to get through. Um, so I have made it as far as this little boat shelter, um, which I knew was here. If, if this situation doesn't change by the morning, I'm gonna to have to hit the SOS button, which for me is really, really humiliating. Um, I like to think I'm like quite experienced 
in the mountains, in the outdoors, I'm prepared. I am prepared. I am experienced. I know what I'm doing. Um, this trip has been incredible. It's been challenging. Um, but there's only so much I can do when I don't have skis and <laughs> it's snow this deep. And you might be able to hear the wind. It's been so full on today. So I'm absolutely exhausted. I just don't have the energy to be dealing with this amount of snow and this cold. Um, so... <sighs> Wait and see. The next day, I covered a total of two kilometres to an emergency hut. So, here's my shit situation today. Um, the conditions that I was trekking in yesterday got a hell of a lot worse as the afternoon went on. Um, until I ended up in quite a scary situation actually. Um, I've never felt like that in the mountains. Um, so I had to take a pretty big decision um, and I activated the SOS on my Garmin um, and I've just been talking to the Swedish police and they're sending a helicopter to get me. Um, I feel like a bit of an idiot for getting myself into this situation. Um, but they said I'm definitely doing the right thing, the weather is just going to get worse. So yeah, feels pretty rubbish. Activating my SOS was one of the hardest things I've had to do. It was not a decision I took lightly, and I am grateful for the support of the Swedish police and mountain rescue who came to my aid. Finding myself in this situation was an important reminder that conditions can change fast, particularly in the mountains. No matter how experienced or prepared you are, things can still go wrong. It took me a while to process these events. One minute I was having one of the best adventures I've been on, and the next? Well, the next I was in that boat shelter, huddled in my sleeping bag, an emergency bivvy bag to stay warm, trying to comprehend the situation. It is in moments like these when being by myself, several days away from civilization and other people, is really not so great. I would have given a lot to just be able to confer with someone, discuss what my options were, have some sort of reassurance that activating my SOS was the right thing to do. I know now, in hindsight, that it absolutely was, and that I handled things correctly, but at the time I experienced intense self-doubt, which trickles into my mind when I think back to those hours I spent convincing myself to push that SOS button. Despite the abrupt and upsetting ending to this adventure, I can't wait to go back. These mountains will forever be somewhere I feel the best version of myself, my happy place and refuge. <laughs>